Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and this is the Dan Clark Audio E3 Planar Magnetic Closed Back Headphone. This is 2000 US dollars. It was a kind loan to me by Audio 46. Audio 46 has made no attempt to influence my opinion on this piece, so all thoughts you are about to get are mine and mine alone. The link in the description where you can buy this from Audio 46 will be an affiliate link, so if you like what I have to say about this product and are interested in buying it, please consider using that affiliate link and I will get a small kickback. And I use all affiliate link money to just support the channel and not just simply to enrich myself. So um, we'll go ahead and do shameless self-promotion and then we'll come back on the other side and we will talk about the E3. Hi, I'm Wave Theory's Human Companion and he wants you to know that your support of this YouTube channel helps keep the reviews coming. If you enjoy Wave Theory's honest, thorough style, then make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and check out the links in the description below to sign up for the Patreon, or send him a tip through PayPal. All right, enjoy the musings. As usual, there is a lot to get to here, so uh, use the timestamps to navigate around and get to the stuff that you uh, that is most relevant to you. We are going to go through, I'll do an overhead view here where I show you a close-up of the build of this thing because like all other Dan Clarks that I have reviewed, there are some very interesting design features to it that I think will be better suited to a, a more close-up view to talk about build and all of that. Then we'll come back and we will talk about the sound of this thing and uh, how it matches to a lot of amps because we'll go ahead and uh, get the punchline out of the way here and then we'll unpack it as we go. This is a very comfortable and well-built headphone, right? So no real issues there. The sound on this thing can be excellent. When properly powered, this thing is in the running for best, all, best sounding all around or all around best sounding closed back. We'll go with that. Uh, probably under $3,000. So the performance on this thing, the performance ceiling on this thing is very high and it can sound excellent. However, that when properly powered, uh, little claws in there is doing a lot of work because even though the specs on this thing and I think it's about 27 ohms and about a 90 decibel per milliwatt sensitivity rating on here suggests that it is rather easy to power and it is from a loudness standpoint like you can get this thing plenty loud without a ton of power but the control that it needs uh, requires an amp that's got some oomph to it or at least is able to deliver uh, electrical energy to this thing very quickly uh, and so we'll unpack that as we go through the uh, review here too and then of course talk about some comparisons with some other closed back models all right so uh, let's get to it again use the timestamps and all of that and the first thing we'll do is cut to the overhead view where i talk about the build of this thing here we go all right, the DCA E3 comes in this rather compact box, which is tucked nicely inside the shipping com uh, carton and all of that. And it just opens up on this flap here. And inside we have the carrying case, all right? And this little pouch, which I'll show you in a minute. And then we also have down there things like user guide, certificate of authenticity, et cetera, et cetera, all that. The box really isn't the point of this other than it doesn't, you know, it comes pretty compact shipping and all of that. Let's zoom in a little closer again and look at these things individually. All right, here we go. This little felt bag right here, or velvet bag, has the cable in it. And the one that got sent to me is a three meter long cable. And then Dan Clark likes these Vivo connectors. I believe, I believe that's what the Vivo refers to, which are spring locking, okay, in there. And they only fit on the, the headphone one particular way. Come on, focus. So you like, you can't really screw that up. All right, this particular one was terminated in a four pin XLR, so it's a balanced cable on the amp. And, and this one is three meters long, and um, that's too long for a desktop setting. Like the, this, it's, it's not that it really tangles up on itself, but it's just very long and it's a little bit on the thicker and heavier side. Um, and the other thing is, is like, I don't know if I could get it to do it here, but it will loop around back on itself on occasion. So it doesn't have a ton of memory, but it does have some, but even so, like, I th think that in spirit, this is probably one of the better headphone cable, stock headphone cables that you can get, um, 
with a headphone here is just that um, unless you really need the three meter long length, I would order this with a shorter one because it just, again, that three meters just got to be too long and cumbersome because I use these in a desktop setting. I could see the three meter length being helpful if you like to use this for like movie and TV watching where your amp is across the room and your couch or your chair is back from your screen away, then the three meter makes sense. But in a, um, a situation like that, go for it. But in just a normal everyday use kind of thing, this was just a little bit too long and cumbersome. Fortunately, Dan Clark offers like 1.1 and two meters options um, if I remember from the website correctly. So I'd look into one of those for OTG and desktop use. Okay, you get this nice solid little carrying case that has the headphone in it. And this is one of the indicators that tell, you know, that tell me that uh, Dan Clark thinks that this is a good portable use headphone and it kind of is. All right, more about that when we get to the sound, but here's how it fits inside of there. Okay, so couple of notches inside there that fits the, uh, what is it, these, what are these called? The gimbals that stick out there, stick right down in there, okay? But this is a nice little carrying case. It's solid enough to like comfortably and safely transport this and you can throw this in your backpack or your suitcase or whatever while you're traveling and it's probably, and it's, you know, it's gonna support a fair amount of weight and not get easily crushed and all of that. All right, here's the headphone itself and it's got some interesting design features which is why I wanted to use this vantage point to show them to you. Okay, it folds up like this. So this unfolds and now you get something that looks more like a headphone. And so then we have this suspension strap system right here, which is the same system I believe that the Stealth and the Expanse had where you have these like spring steel things going on here. And then you have this, um, ex you know, this ex elastic -y extension here on the headband, okay, like this. And this will naturally adjust to fit your, your head size and hold these in the proper position. And I found that it worked pretty well for me. And like the comfort on this headphone is pretty outstanding, honestly. It's, a, it's you know, what, what, I think about 450 grams or something like that, very close to that. And it just, it distributes the weight well. And like this part, because of the elastic stretchiness, it kind of conforms to your head. So it does a good job of avoiding hot spots and that sort of thing. And the clamp is just enough to mostly keep it in place, but it still feels rather loose and light on the head. It does not clamp particularly hard. All right. It is a, this one is a closed back as uh, discussed earlier. So it kind of looks like it could be an open back because it's got this grill like pattern, but that is just, a design thing. This is a Gorilla Glass plate right here, and these two holes are like ports, basically, base ports. So it does have pretty good isolation when it's on your head. It's not like the most isolating thing I have ever heard, but it does a pretty good job of, of holding ambient sounds out and also keeping music sounds in. Again, not perfect, not the best close back I've ever heard in that regard, but it's not bad. All right, um, but yeah, these are little base ports. They don't really allow a whole lot of sound out. They're just there for dissipating energy inside the cup because you get a lot of acoustic energy in there. It's gotta go somewhere, and if you don't get rid of it, it can mess with the sound. So this port system is how they did that. Okay, but this is a Gorilla Glass plate here, and you can kind of see how reflective it is from my, my light there and all that, but you can also see that it fingerprints up easily. So you might want to have a cloth available to uh, keep this clean if those fingerprints bother you because like it's just glass and you can kind of see my fingerprints on there anyway. So that's something that you're going to want to be aware of. All right. Pretty big ear cup size here. Will accommodate most ear sizes and all of that. It's got a fair amount of a depth to it. It's like this pleather or leather on the outside. And then like, I, I think that is suede right there on the part that actually touches the head and so forth. A slight forward angle to the pads not a huge one. Okay. Um, planar magnetic driver. It's the AMTS driver. That is the acoustic metamaterial tuning system, I think. I had that written down and I lost the, <laughs> the page or I didn't bring it over here. But I think that's what it means. Fifth generation AMTS driver in there. Um, and Dan Clark says that gives them very tight control over the tuning, the tonality and the frequency response and all of that. And I think I pretty much agree with that because these are very neutrally tuned and they have very good tonal balance to them. We'll get more into that more in the sound section. Okay. But this is a well-made headphone. It is very comfortable. It is reasonably well isolating as a closed back. Okay. And then it collapses up into this small shape. 
Okay, and fits into this relatively small carrying case right here, about knocked my lamp over. Okay, fits into this small carrying case right here. And you know, that is, I mean, that's nice. Like there's a lot of convenience to that. And so from a build and ergonomic standpoint, like these are really like on the go or transportable friendly headphones. Of course, you can use a desk or you can use a closed back headphone in a desktop environment. Like if you're at work or just at home or all that, or if you just generally prefer closed back headphones, of course, but like just because of the way they collapse down like this and all of that, that like just from a build standpoint, there definitely is like a strong leaning towards being on the go and transportable friendly. Now, I, again, mostly agree with that. The one thing that I'm going to talk about that here is like these do need a little bit of power, and I'm not just talking about SPLs, right? You can get plenty of SPLs out of these um, with not a whole lot of power input, but uh, you lose some stuff along the way, and I'm going to unpack that in the sound and all of that. But again, Good job on the build and the comfort from Dan Clark. He knocks that out of the park with every unit that I've gotten from him. So like that, uh, or um, from his brand anyway, these didn't come directly from him. They came from Audio 46, but all that. So no complaints there. So let's get back to me talking about test gear and sound and all of that stuff. Turning our attention towards sound, I normally list out a very thorough list of all of the test gear that I use for this, and I did use it a pretty extensive variety of test gear on this, uh, but I'm going to save the amplifiers portion of that towards uh, after the sound uh, description here because um, we need to talk about the drivability of this thing. And so I will name several amps and even hold some of them up for you to see here uh, when we get to that point. But as far as music sources go for this thing, um, a lot of the music sources, the sourcing that I used was through Rune. Uh, and I would play either, uh, I would play local files that are either DSD or lossless and or high res FLAC. Um, again, through Rune, um, and, or I would stream lossless or high-res flak via Kobuz, again, delivered through Rune. Rune endpoints would be my Sonor Ultra Rendu streamer or the Chord 2 Go streamer, uh, which would have been mated to my Chord Hugo 2. The Ultra Rendu would have been routed through uh, a Singer SU6 DDC and then into my Berkeley Alpha Series 2 DAC. Um, or... Did I use anything? Uh, yes, I also used, and this is a reveal coming up. I have in a niche Pietus Maximus uh, amplifier as well that um, drove this thing um, from there as well. So that's one thing that I, I used in there. Um, Hugo 2 would have fed that. And then I think at a time I used the Musician Pegasus 2, the single ended output of that into the Pietus Maximus, plus its own onboard um, uh, multi-bit DAC card in there um, as well to test this. All right, um, other uh, amps we will get to in a moment. So let's talk about the overall sound impressions on this thing. And I mentioned at the top of the video that I think that when properly powered, and again, that phrase is doing some work, okay? But when properly powered, this thing is in the running for being the, the all-around best sounding closed back, probably under about 3,000 US dollars. And so I'll kind of get to why I say 3,000 instead of 2,000 when we get to the comparison section here in just a little bit, okay? Um, so when properly driven, let's start there and talk about its performance ceiling and what it's capable of. Uh, Dan Clark, uh, the, the other two Dan Clarks that I've heard are the Expanse and the Stealth, and this one is tuned very similar to either of those, except it doesn't quite have the little bass shelf, the bass bump that the Expanse has, but this one hews very, very closely to, I think it's like the Harman 2018 target or something like that, and is very close to that curve, much like the Stealth is, and like you can look up on the online here, um, and find frequency response graphs for this thing. And the difference between this and the Stealth is pretty minimal in terms of the tuning. So what that translates to is uh, about as close to what Harman considered natural, or excuse me, neutral, um, when they made that curve. And my ears more or less agree here. For the most part, 
There is very good tonal balance through the entire frequency range, good relationships between fundamental frequencies and their harmonics, and then also like all of the major areas of the frequency spectrum, the bass, the mid-range, the treble, are all in a pretty natural sounding uh, relationship to each other, so it does come across as a very neutral sounding headphone. There is a slight, and I do mean slight, bit of emphasis to my ears here in the upper mid-range. It avoids shou sounding shouty or honky to me for the most part, but on some program material, particularly like hard rock and things like that, uh, the upper mids can get a bit glary to my ear, which does get a bit fatiguing. Again, it does not happen all of the time. The amount to which that happens, uh, that glariness happens also is signal chain dependent and it's also recording dependent. Okay, but uh, it's almost always there to a, a, a little degree, but it can get pushed up. So that's just... If there is a, an excess forwardness anywhere in its frequency response, it is in the upper mids there that just gives it a little bit of bite. But then that also, I think, helps with a sense of clarity of this um, headphone too, because again, when properly powered, it is very clear, it's got lots of details, it's got lots of clarity. The detail retrieval is not pushed forward, but there is also excellent separation, not only spatially, but in terms of like instrument and vocal separation, all of that very well. It's just all very well separated out and presented well and like cleanly and clearly and coherently. The sound stage on this is very nice and wide. It is also tall, it's got some depth to it. Um, as well, and, and like the imaging and the separation and the layering and all of that are nicely holographic and projects a pretty good three-dimensional sense of space in the listening and all of that. So live recordings and orchestras and symphonies and all of that kind of stuff do a pretty convincing job of convincing you that you are there and, and so forth. Um, detail retrieval, again, also excellent. There is just that slight forwardness in the upper mid. So through the upper mid range, there's just a little bit of emphasis on some of the details in that frequency range, all of that. But there is good detail retrieval uh, throughout the entire frequency uh, spectrum and that sort of thing. The, the treble is also nice and smooth. It avoids sibilance and sharpness and all of that. Cymbal crashes don't get too fatiguing and they sound mostly pretty smooth and natural and, uh, and, and so forth. The biggest thing that impressed me about the sound here on this that is an improvement, I think, over what I have heard from Dan Clark previously is that there is a better sense of dynamic impact here. Like the uh, the bass actually has a little bit of slam to it and there's a bit of punch in the mid bass and that sort of thing. There's a good quick snap on snare drum hits, which I think that mid range forwardness helps a little bit, all that. but. To me, the the stealth and to the lesser to a lesser extent the the expanse those things were just kind of um, dynamically dull, right? Especially the stealth. The expanse was an improvement, but not really a full fix on this. Where they just really didn't have a whole lot of slam. They just didn't have a whole lot of dynamics and all of and and so forth. And I know that they are very difficult loads. They are hard to drive. But I had them on some fairly powerful amps, and they just didn't quite come through in the dynamics department. This improves on that greatly. Like this, these slam hard enough and have enough impact that I don't notice that they are absent. They are not going to be head slammers. They're not gonna, you know, um, kick your head around like a Fostex or a Focal or sometimes an Odyssey is gonna do. They are maybe not quite as slammy as like a HiFiMan HE1000 SE is or, or, you know, or the new Aria Organic is, you know, in, or in that range, but these are a, a step up from the expanse and all of that, which is also already a step up from the stealth in terms of that. And there's enough of the dynamics here to not make me miss it. And I sent an all caps excited uh, message to a friend of mine who likes the expanse, um, which I guess some do, but anyway, he likes them. And um, I was like, there's dynamics. And then uh, I think he gave me a middle finger emoji in response. But anyway, um, so they, there's great improvement there. And to me, that just really fills out the sound and makes this a much more complete sounding headphone, uh, generally speaking, and all of that. So this is my favorite Dan Clark that I have heard so far in terms of the sound. I just I think it strikes a really good balance of a good natural frequency response and tonality. It's got good resolution. It doesn't push the detail retrieval forward except for save that one um, area in the upper mids where it comes forward a little bit, but it's not overdone most of the time. 
Um, and it's got a really big and holographic spatial presentation and pretty, you know, fairly natural timbre to it most of the time. And yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, it really is one of the best sounding closed back headphones out there right now. So very good job in terms of the performance ceiling that this is capable of. And I mean, it's an excellent headphone and I'm not, you know, notice that I avoided saying that all of these things that all of these sonic traits that are there are good for a closed back. They are good for a closed back, but they're just also very good for headphones, period. This is just a good sounding headphone, okay, um, open back or not. Like it never sounded claustrophobic or, you know, closed in on me or anything. Like you would be forgiven for thinking it's an open back um, from the sound sometimes just because of all of those traits that I mentioned. And all of that so really well done sonically and all of that in terms of the performance ceiling and what it is capable of now let's turn our attention then to what i say about like when it's properly powered because that matters um the amp that i thought this thing sounded the best on is that new um uh, Hi-Fi Men's Golden Wave uh, Prelude amplifier, and that thing has a ton of power, and is capable of driving Susvara to, uh, you know, reasonably close to its ceiling. Not all the way there, but it's excellent for what it does at twenty-five hundred U.S. dollars. And that I thought was the best pairing for this headphone of the stuff of the uh, amps that I have around because it is just a little bit warmer amp so it warmed the sound of this. It pulled back that mid-range glare just a little bit and that bite just a little bit and smoothed that out and made it tolerable with more um, source material or more you know a wider variety of tracks and that sort of thing and it also had the power to make sure that this thing was resolving everything that it should be resolving. Okay so that worked really well um, there too. Um, after that, I should also say the Vioelectric HPA V281. I tried that one as well, and that one too has plenty of power, warms the sound even more than the Prelude does, uh, maybe isn't quite as resolving or as clear in the detail retri retrieval and that sort of thing, but very close to what the Prelude was doing. So that one also was an excellent amp to drive this. Okay, the Pietus Maximus for a mid a mid range amp there. I think that one's what about five hundred dollars somewhere around there. Also, kind of a warmer, thicker sound was a good match to this. Had plenty of power uh, and all of that, and it's not as holographic or as resolving as the Prelude or the V two eighty one is. It should not be expected to be, but it's still very good, right? And uh, drove this one to a high, a very high percentage of its full potential as well, and all of that. So. Those, all of those amps that I just mentioned there, they have a fair amount of power behind them. So what, where this started getting interesting and uh, where I started to notice these power issues that I'm about to describe was with transportable or portable amplifiers for the most part. Now, when this thing first came in, I had a very brief window of time where I still had the Enlium HPA 23RM in, and the HPA 23RM drove this very well also. Um, it did decently from its uh, voltage output, but it did even better, I thought, from its current drive output and all that in terms of like bringing out the details and all that that this, this thing is capable of. And that Enlium is pretty powerful, right, for, especially for a transportable device, so that one worked well too. But I have some other transportable devices in. Okay, Cord Hugo 2 with its uh, matching 2Go streamer. Use that a fair amount. I've got the Cord Mojo 2 still in right now. I have the uh, X-Duo XD05 Pro right here, transportable DAC amp and uh, blunt force instrument right here. And then also I have my KNHA, no, this is not an HA. This is the N6 Mark II DAP with EO2 module in it. And then I also pulled out, this is not transportable, this is a desktop amp, but the very underrated Urzatich Perfidus amplifier I got out to try this with as well. Okay. And this is where, okay, so these transportable things uh, in particular, they don't always kick out a whole lot of power. And so there were a couple of instances where I started to hear how this changes when it's underpowered. 
All right, so let's let's talk about that a little bit. And then the uh, the Perfidus I got up because uh, Blaz Erzatik told me that uh, this thing outputs about 150 milliwatts per channel of power, basically regardless of impedance load. Um, and it actually handles the high flame and HE6 SEV2 like surprisingly well. Like every time that I think, am I sure, was I right about that? I plug these two in to get those two in together. And I'm like, yeah, I was right. So this, this handles that pretty well, but 150 milliwatts. So I wanted to hear what it would do with the E3. Okay, when the E3 is underpowered, some things can happen. One is, is that the, the spatial presentation starts to get a little mushy. It loses its coherence. It loses that separation that made it really strong and holographic okay, in there. That's one of the first things to go. The, the bass also like will kind of hit, but like kick drum hits and all of that start to get a little splashy. There's not like a good solid hit there. It's just like, you know, instead of like hitting something solid, it's like punching something made of putty almost. Like it's just a little bit sloppy in there, splashy, okay, on those kick drum hits again when it's underpowered. And then also like a couple of other interesting things can happen. That that upper mid bite that I talked about can come forward some. And then also this one was really weird. The overall sonic uh, perform, the overall like perceived frequency response presentation can get warmer when it's underpowered. And I think that's because in the low end, the uh, the decays lengthen a little bit. Like when the, the amp is underpowered, it doesn't bring the driver back into its rest position as quickly as it should. So you get a little bit more overhang. So it sounds a little bit wetter, but then it also just means that there just seems like there's more bass going on in there than there is when this is properly powered. Okay, where did I notice these things happening? The chords. As good as they are, and they are good devices, do not match well to the E3. They just don't have the power that it needs to get that last bit of detail out. And these are the two that stood out to me as the E3 sounds warm. These cords are not really warm sounding devices, particularly the Hugo 2 here. Very neutral, very incisive. If anything, it's a little bit tonally lean and possibly just a little bit light in terms of presence in the sub bass. The Mojo 2 is a little bit warmer, but it doesn't have the amp uh, a little bit warmer than the Hugo 2. Not warm in a general sense, probably, and it also doesn't have the same amount of output power. But on both of these devices, the E3 sounded warmer than it did from the Prelude or the Vio, the V281 or the Pietus Maximus, all of that. Like, it just sounded warmer. Like, the bass sounded fuller, but also muddier and less overall controlled. And again, you got those splashy kick drum impacts and all of that sort of thing in there. So, these two underpower it and it just gets warmer. And then again, it also loses that spatial separation and it loses a bit of its detail retrieval and resolution capability. And then especially on the Hugo 2, that, um, that mid upper mid-range bite and glare becomes a little bit more, even more overpowering than it does in, on other amps too. Okay. The, the N6 Mark II DAP here with the EO2 module, similar story, uh, warms the sound, although not to the level that the, the two chords did, but also like this one was probably the worst at pushing that upper mid-range bite forward. Um, and so it just got very glary in the upper mids for me and all, and all of that too. And this, and I had to turn this one on to high gain and push the volume all the way up. And I should mention on the chords, like, so I'm, I'm at 100 on, at 100, you know, was at 100 out of 100 on high gain on this thing. And it was plenty loud, like it was probably averaging just over 70 dB average sound pressure level. But it was just missing a lot of stuff. A lot of the details were gone and then that, that mid-range forwardness and glare was there and the, like that warmth in the bass that was not otherwise there, also there. Okay. Basically, I'd have to push the uh, the Hugo 2's volume wheel, if you're familiar with how that works, like I'd have to push it all the way up to like purple, almost white, okay, to get the SPLs that I wanted here. And then again, it was lacking things. And then again, I was also maxing out the volume on the Mojo 2 to get it up to that level as well. Okay. The XD05 is an interesting case with the E3 because like it's all of the things that I describe about the E3 in one device. 
This does have the power to push this pretty properly, honestly, but it does it in its turbo mode. I'm not yet done with a review of this. It's getting near completion, so there's going to be a full review of this coming out very soon. But it has three levels of power output that are kind of like gain, but they're not actually gain and not in, insofar as the amount of output level doesn't actually increase when you increase this. We'll just call it gain for now, even though it's something else. Okay, But it does increase like the control and the amount of out, like energy that it puts through the thing. Like It's, it's weird, right? Like... The eco mode on this does not have the power output to control this. The normal power mode on this, same thing. Same characteristics that I just described about these other uh, portable devices are there. Like you just, you lose some of the spatial presentation, you lose some of the detail retrieval, that mid-range, upper mid bite gets a little bit bitier and glary and that sort of thing and all of that. Um, the, until you turn on the turbo power mode on this and then the e3 sounds like it's supposed to that warmth cleans up and the base like that warmth goes away the base cleans up the holography comes back the detail retrieval comes back and all of that so this can push this just fine um, but it also drains the battery pretty quick to do so right so that is one device that does work and it does all of those things that i described in one unit the Perfidus, I don't know what Blaz did to this thing, um, what kind of voodoo he made this out of, because it drives this really well. I didn't think it would, because even at 150 milliwatts, which apparently somehow scales with the, uh, the load that it is under, like it handled this well. Even on like the 1812 Overture that I have by Eric Kunzel and the Cincinnati Pops where you've got full orchestra, you've got real cannon fire, you have a vocal choir and you've got a handbell choir and all of that all going on at once in the finale of that track. This amp and this headphone held together, held it together pretty well at even pretty high volumes. So that one worked okay there. Um, so even though it's 150 milliwatt output power, drove this well. And I'm not like, I think the Perfidus might just be an odd case just because of the way it's made and it's an underrated amplifier, okay? This is not a Perfidus review. See my uh, uh, review. I will link to it in the description below um, for that. But back to the E3 here. Like, it, you really do need some power to get this to sound like what it's supposed to sound like. And it's not an SPL thing. All of the devices that I just showed you, you can turn their volume up enough to get this to ear-splitting volume levels. Okay, except maybe the uh, the N6 Mark II. Okay, because I maxed that out and it was maybe a 72, 70s to 72 dB average. The cords, the X Duo, even on its lower power settings and all of that, um, they can push this thing plenty loud. It's not about volume. Okay, so the the impedance rating of 27 ohms and the sensitivity rating of about 90 decibels per milliwatt on here probably are accurate. It's not super power hungry from a loudness standpoint. It is power hungry from a cleanliness and resolution and just sounding like it's supposed to standpoint. Okay, so... Um, you do need to think about like what you're going to be driving this with. And again, because it's closed back, because it's got that nice carrying case, and because it collapses down like this to fit into that small um, carrying case and all of that, like a lot of people are going to be attracted to taking this on the go with them and making it a traveling companion. But you are going to have to be careful about what amp you choose to take with it. This XD05 Pro will push this well in its turbo power mode, but again, you're gonna drain the battery quickly. The Enlium HPA23RM would be a higher end, like higher quality yet than this um, option for this to power that this just fine, but you're also gonna have battery life issues with that as well. Okay, but unfortunately, other popular devices, like a lot of daps are gonna be out. These cords, the Hugo 2 and the Mojo 2, in my opinion, out. Someone will probably like what they do sonically, um, but I don't think it's quite there in what this thing is truly capable of. All right, so those are my thoughts there on the, the sound and the power of just this thing. Let's talk a little bit more about where it fits in the market in comparisons with other closed backs. 
Keeping it in the family first here, and, I, and I'm gonna compare this mostly to closed backs and do like a like for like kind of uh, comparison um, on this because I think if you're if you're in the market for a closed back, I mean you're gonna want to know where this stacks up in the closed back market, right? So keeping it in the family first, let's compare it to the other Dan Clark closed back that I have heard, and that is the Stealth, right? Which is four thousand U.S. dollars, so twice the price on this. Now for me personally. I would take this over the stealth anytime. And the reason is, is I think it's, it's, I mean, they are tuned very similarly. They have a very similar frequency response and sound signature from that uh, standpoint. The stealth, I'm going from memory here. I did not hear them back to back. Um, I, sus I suspect that the stealth is a little bit bigger yet in its sound staging, a little bit more holographic in its spatial presentation, and a little bit more resolving in its overall detail retrieval and that sort of thing. Uh, the Stealth, though, is harder to drive than this one, okay? Uh, so this one is just a little bit more amp-friendly than the Stealth is, okay? And then the Stealth just has very little dynamic impact to speak of. And this one, while not amazing in that category, is a big step up in the dynamics there. So this is my favorite Dan Clark headphone that I have heard so far. Um, I... It, I really enjoyed listening to it in a way that I did not enjoy listening to the Stealth or even the Expanse, honestly. Um, I didn't hate those other headphones. I just didn't think that they were quite what they were cracked up to be for $4,000 units. They had some drawbacks that I just didn't find appropriate for the price point. Um, but this, I... Um, this one I, I, I do like here at $2,000. So there we go, brief comparison with the Stealth. Let's start working our way down the price point, just the, down the price ladder, so you can start to see why I said earlier this might be the best sound, best all-around sounding close back under three thousand U.S. dollars. Because at three thousand USD, you've got the Focal Stelia. And that one is getting a bit long in the tooth right now. The Stelia is going to be more impactful and more resolving than this one. Um, and uh, it's maybe a little bit easier to drive. It, it's more like mobile amp friendly and that sort of thing. But the Stelia has an odd tuning to it where it's, it's, it's a little bit forward in the mid range or reduced in the lower mids or something. It sounds shouty, it sounds honky and that sort of thing to me. So I think this one has the better tuning. The Stelia is also a little bit smaller in stage and, um, and so forth. And it also has that Focal like 360 degree bubble around the head kind of spatial presentation, which is not a, a good or a bad thing generally. And it's not necessarily better or worse than this. It's just different. You'll have to make your uh, own determination as to whether or not that is worth it okay but this one is definitely going to stage bigger and more speaker like out in front of you kind of a thing than like more in the performance like the stelia is going to do but because of the tuning issues of the stelia and this one being dynamic enough for me to not really miss the dynamics um i think like i would take this over the stelia as just like in terms of performance ceiling on um for a closed back headphone Coming down to 2,500 US dollars, you've got the ZMF Virate closed, and then you have the Atrium closed. Now, a big caveat here is I have not heard the Atrium closed yet, but I do have one on its way to me, so stand by for that. But I've heard at least two different uh, versions of the, uh, two different wood types anyway, of the Virate closed. And the Virate Closed is, a, is fine. It has a little bit of tuning wonkiness to it as well. Like I thought it was a little bit mid forward, both of them that I heard. And it also wasn't particularly resolving. So this one really out resolves the Virate Closed and I think works for a wider range of music than the Virate Closed does because the, the Virate needed a little bit more small scale, less instruments, more intimate kind of music um, because the ZMF sound has kind of always been about that like more savory timbre kind of thing where you're just like, like there's a few instruments, a little bit more intimate, and, and uh, maybe a, a couple of vocals here and there, and it just sounds like really lush and natural with those kinds of things. But if you ask them to do more, they just, their resolving capability falls off and they get kind of mushy, even when you properly power them. This one, with proper power, like holds all of that together again, and so it, it works a, a little bit. Uh, better for a wider range of music to my ear than the Virate Closed does. So I would take this over a Virate Closed, even though that's $2,500 as compared to $2,000. All right, 
Getting into much more like-for-like -like comparisons, right at $2,000, there are two other planar magnetic closebacks out there that I have heard, and those would be the Meze Lyric and the Hi-Fi Min Audivina. And I thought those were both terrible, okay? Um, the Audivina might be the worst of the two, but if you just see my reviews, I will link to them in the description down below. I didn't like either of those at all. They both had some really severe flaws to them sonically, so I would easily take this and recommend this over uh, either of those other $2,000 planar magnetic closed backs there. Dropping in price just a little bit more, well, I should say right around $2,000 anymore, is the Fostex TH900 series, and I have mine here that has the Lawton Purple Heart Chambers on it um, aftermarket there, which so again, it kind of right around 2,000. If you're going to put Lawton Chambers on, it might be a little bit more than 2,000 US dollars there. Um, the the TH900 series can also sound really good. The Biodyna drivers in it though are a little bit weird in terms of they need a lot of um, not not a lot of power. They are just very synergy picky, right? They are very very amp picky. And there are very few amps that I have heard that they jive well with. But when they do, they have lots of really hard-hitting, powerful bass and sub-bass extension and rumble and all of that. They have a, a fairly organic timbre and, all, and so forth. But they are almost always a little bit V-shaped in their uh, signature. So uh, they don't always work for everyone and all of that. So... There are going to be some genres of music and some signal chain uh, combinations where I will prefer what my TH900 does with the Lawton Chambers, what it does over what the DCA E3 does. Okay, but those are hard combinations to reach. Okay, like I, I can't recommend outward just that anyone go out and pick up a TH900 and uh, you know it's going to sound great because you have to put a lot of care, even more care into your signal chain than you do with this one. And then also just because of the V-shaped nature and how hard hitting the Biodyna drivers are and like how unforgiving they can be in the treble and all of that, you know, it, the TH900 series isn't a great to every genre, match to every genre of music. Like this one is more of a generalist in terms of genre of music. So I think for most people, the E3 is going to be preferable over the TH900 series more often. Okay, so continuing down in the price range here, uh, you get to about $1,300, $1,400, I want to say right around in there, you get two more out there. One of them, I don't have it with me, but it's the Odyssey LCD-X Closed Back Edition. Um, I'm thinking about the 2021 version, which I have a review of and will link down in the description below. The LCDX closed there can sound amazing and probably come pretty close to what the E3 can do in terms of resolution. It can outdo it in terms of dynamics and impact and all of that. The issue with the LCDX closed, there are two of them. One is much bigger and heavier and more uncomfortable okay, than the E3. The E3 is not uncomfortable at all. It's very comfortable. Okay, the uh, LCDX, LCDXC is just going to be too heavy and on a comfort issue for a lot of people. So that's something to keep in mind. The other thing is, is that the out-of-the-box tuning of the LCDXC is not great. Okay, it's very mid-forward, shouty, honky. It is very recessed in the bass and and so forth and like it, that like the the forwardness of the mid-range kind of collapses what is what um the the sound stage and the imaging and the separation and all of that so you pretty much have to eq the lcd xc to get it to sound anything anywhere close to what this one can do so you're just you're tethered to what uh, what device or device is will allow you to do the necessary equalization for that headphone so Provided you give this one proper power, which again is not uh, ridiculous to achieve. This one, you don't need to, to tinker with it as much, or at least I found that it, you don't need to tinker with it quite as much to get it to sound right. And then you're just, you're not tethered to that single signal chain that has the EQ on it. All right, at $1,300, we have the Dynamic Driver Focal Radiance, which has long been my favorite closed back because it just does the most right, even though it's $1,300. Like, it just has the best combination of resolution slash detail retrieval, tuning, um, isolation, like the ability to hold sound in and, like, not let sound leak and all of that. 
um, and comfort and all that. And plus, it is really easy to drive. Now, the, uh, the comparison between these two then, the, the Radiance is going to be warmer and basier. It has a bit of a base shelf on it, which is not going to be for everyone, but it also it has more dynamics. It's a Focal. It's got that harder hitting, slamming, that kind of thing than the E3 is. I also think that it is a bit more lush and natural in the timbre yet than the E3 is. It's a very small gap there because the E3 is very good at those things, but it just, to me, just sounds more organic and a little bit closer to the real thing more often, especially through the upper mids, than the E3 does. But when properly powered, the E3 has the bigger stage and the more accurate and three-dimensional holographic uh, spatial presentation, and it just barely out-resolves the, the Radiance 2, again, when properly powered. But... Hugo 2 sounds great with this. Mojo 2 sounds great with this. My little KN N6 Mark II DAP with the EO2 module also sounds really good with this, right? Like this thing is, the Radiance is not very power hungry. So you, you can take it with you and drive it with, uh, drive it comfortably and accurately and well with a wider range of, of transportable audio gear than you can with the E3. So it, that has the advantage there. All right, so what does all of this mean in terms of the E3 and whether or not I recommend it and all of that? So I stand by the claim that I made where this could be the, it very well could be the all around best sounding closed back headphone under 3000 US dollars, okay? The performance ceiling on this is very high. It does need a little bit of power though, like not a ridiculous amount, but, um, and it's not, again, it's not about the loudness. It's not about SPL, sound pressure level, when I'm talking about power here. It is about that refinement, that last bit of detail retrieval and spatial separation and instrument and vocal separation and that sort of thing. And then also the tonal accuracy, all that, just that last bit about it, that um, it needs a little bit of power to sound right. And again, not a ridiculous amount of power, but enough power that a lot of popular um, portable and transportable devices that are out there are not going to be enough for this. So some care should be taken in terms of what you're matching this to if you're going to use it on the go or mobily. But most desktop amplifiers are going to be fine, okay? Um, so if you're going to use it in the desktop, a little bit less uh, worry there. But it's good, right? The um, it, It's my favorite Dan Clark that I've heard to date, okay? And I've heard the two top-of-the-line models, so there is that too. The only thing that I would say is that if you're going to use this mobily or transportably, the Radiance might be a slightly better value. Even though it sounds a little different, I think it's just a little bit better value if that's the use case you're going to take it with, just because you don't have to spend as much or hunt around as much to find a portable amp that will drive this thing. But otherwise, I did enjoy my time here with the E3. Uh, I, I liked listening to, to music a lot. It earned my trust pretty quickly and I used it to you know do some comparisons between amplifiers that are in right now like um you know just as a, as a reference there while I had it I could tell it was good and it had good resolution like was resolving enough to do all of that for me and so while it was here I used it to do that and it did a good job so um yeah so I, I will recommend it there, provided that you have the amplifier that will handle it in the use case that you want. It's uh, a very good headphone, not just closed back headphone, but a very good headphone. All right. So we'll go ahead and leave it there. I am Wave Theory. Thanks for watching. This has been my review of the Dan Clark Audio E3 closed back planar magnetic headphone. Please like this video if you haven't yet. Leave a comment down below. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Check out my PayPal and my Patreon and generally do those things you do to support YouTube channels. Thanks again for watching and as always, enjoy the music.